Welcome to the Shield Safety Excellence webinar. I'm David Walker. I have the pleasure of taking you through the next 45 minutes or so. Um, we've got three fantastic speakers lined up who I'm sure you're going to enjoy, uh, who are going to give a whole range of useful and practical insights and ideas. The concept of excellence is all about opportunity. Uh, the word unprecedented, I think, has been used a lot over the last year or two. Um, but the next two and a half months do offer what I think we can call an unprecedented opportunity that we haven't seen before in hospitality. Because obviously the Christmas period is traditionally the busiest for pubs, bars, restaurants, hotels, leisure venues. And for the first time ever, we have uh, Christmas coinciding with the Football World Cup. So from Sunday the 20th of November, every day offers a considerable and huge opportunity for venues to maximize revenues right up to the Christmas weekend, which is 35 consecutive days. Um, but to truly understand the opportunity we have, I think it's also worth exploring the context in which excellence finds itself in. It's the first year since 2019, we have no restrictions. Hopefully there'll be no restrictions. So there'll be a pent up demand for office parties, family get togethers, and people generally enjoying themselves without having to think about uh, any restrictions in terms of numbers of meetings. We also have feedback. Sounds still okay? Yeah. Okay, that's better. We also have the backdrop of the Lioness victory in European Championships. We've got an increased awareness and interest in what's going on in football. We've got potentially different requirements happening in those venues, whether that is um, people wanting a Christmas party to watch the World Cup, people just watching the World Cup and not wanting a Christmas party, family get together. So there's a lot to process and a lot to go through. So we've got a massive opportunity. And with those opportunity, of course, however, come risks. And the purpose of this webinar is to explore some of those opportunities and balance them with the risks. And we hope to give you some ideas and a framework which allows you to both prepare for a fantastic excellent season and also keeping your colleagues and customers safe. So we have three great speakers. Uh, Rob is going to talk to us about preparing for excellence on a practical level. Graham's going to talk through some of the legal aspects, but we're going to start by handing over to Sylvia from Best Bar None, who's going to talk about the consumer. So Sylvia, may I pass over to you? Thank you very much, David, um, and thanks so much for having me along to this session. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so, so a little bit about me. So my name is Sylvia Oates. Um, there is me so uh, safely socialising at um, the BII event, I think it was earlier this year. Um, I have worked uh, in or with the licence trade uh, for, oh gosh, uh, probably coming up with about 25 years or so. So um, sort of started glass collecting and then got the bug from there um, and went through all sorts of different career iterations. But around 2009, I um, joined Nottingham Business Improvement District as the chief executive there. And that started my kind of very niche passion um, in relation to partnership working between uh, the licensed trade and the statutory partners and supporting basically the licensed trade to be, um, you know, to, to sort of operate as, as responsibly and as successfully as, as possible um, in the context of sort of, you know, safe places to socialise and making sure that everybody sort of played their part out and about in the street as well as, as, as those premises running um you know your safe operations yourself as well so um i now have a business uh, 6 or 6 and we do a lot of work with towns and cities around that kind of safe socializing agenda but i also run the national best fund on scheme and um thinking about exomus i thought my uh, angle on it today is about the agenda around sort of um well-being and making sure that everybody that comes to visit you uh, is is as well looked after and feels as well looked after as they possibly can um, do I need to move my slides on or do I say next slide, please? Ah, there we are. It's a Chris Whitty moment. Um, in terms of customer thoughts, so um, th these are from a YouGov survey from last year. So 80%, over 80% of women reported a des desire for pubs, bars and clubs to improve safety procedures. And more than one in four adults aged 18 to 45 are more likely to visit a venue with a safety award. So my reading of these statistics is actually, I think, 
the issue sometimes is that the public aren't necessarily aware of what uh, of all the things that you as operators do to keep them safe and um, to maintain their well-being when they are with you. So sometimes it's not about actually you improving your safety procedures. It's more about you being able to promote the fact that these are all the things that you do. Um, I'm not saying there isn't always room for improvement. And I'll come on to the next slide about some ideas that might help you to do that um, in, a, in a moment. Yep, here we go. Um, however, um, often we, what we find is that when we do sort of walk arounds and we take some of the local partners around and, and they come and speak to the venues they come away going wow I had no idea that they do all these things and they operate all these schemes and there's all this training and policies and procedures so um, it's a really useful exercise when we do get the partners out into the nighttime economy but yeah how can you sort of um, make sure that people know what it is that you do and I'll come on to that in a moment but this slide um in terms of actually upping your game and just making sure that you're as prepared as possible for those two different audiences that um, I say two different audiences, but two different reasons why people might come out over the X almost period. Um, so, I, yeah, that was the perfect slide to stay on if you can for a moment. Um, so, yes, yeah, so these two different uh, reasons to come out might attract different audiences and might sort of. I guess change the dynamic of how it feels in um in your town or city or in your even in your premises if you're you know sort of catering for both audiences um and how do you reassure your customers that that you have done everything possible and that to, to offer them a safe environment in which to enjoy themselves um and actually what can you do practically to make sure that you've done everything possible too so here are some ideas that i have come up with that hopefully are either free or relatively low cost um for you so you may be aware that National Pub Watch and Best Buy None have worked together to produce some template policies. Um, so they are available on the National Pub Watch site and my contact details are at the end. In case you have trouble finding those, you can just always drop me a line and I'll send you a link. But they're very helpful because um, they're not just print off, stick in a folder. They sort of talk you through, you know, you know how to make an actual bespoke uh, policy for your premises, because obviously that's really important that it works for your, your actual operation. Um, I know that's going to they're going to come on to this in a moment, but Shield Safety offers an incredible le uh, level of support, including helplines and free sort of downloadable resources on their site as well. So I'm sure that they'll Rob and people will talk about that a bit later. Um, there's also a PubWatch best practice guide, which is on the PubWatch site, which is a kind of manual for sa a safe operating of a pub. Um, and that's been really well thought through with police input and various, you know, sort of the trade input as well. So that's a nice resource, too. Preparing your team is really useful. So um, you may already operate Ask for Angela, or um, if you don't, you could look to put that in. But um, it's interesting because uh, conversations I've had recently is people saying to me, well, actually, sometimes people don't ask for Angela, they just come to ask for some help. And I say, well, the good thing about Ask for Angela is what it's done is it, it if you implement it in your premises properly what you've done is you have worked out how you as a as an operation responds to somebody that presents as vulnerable whether they've been spotted by your team or whether they come to you and ask for help so I always see the Ask for Angela scheme is, a, is actually just a sort of a way of making sure that you're ready to um, support somebody that doesn't feel safe in your venue um, talking of which uh, we as a business have all have created a uh, workbook that takes you through how to um, prepare your operation for somebody that's vulnerable and all the different things that you could do and what you should do during the event and afterwards and also how to train your staff to respond appropriately and to be to be prepared and be ready so if you'd like a copy of that please contact me that's a free a free guide as well getting involved in local schemes I'll always advocate this there's so many schemes that you can get involved in free of charge and um, can give you great benefits back so again pub watch um, if you don't have a local one and would like to set one up, um, they have area representatives that give their time free of charge to help you to do that. Um, if you're part of a business improvement district, you'll probably be paying a levy, so you may as well make the most of it um, and join a working group or join the board um, and help to make sure that that bid is um, understanding what the issues are around the licensed trade and how they can help support you and represent you and make sure that the partnerships are all sort of you know working around you to, to support your evening and nighttime economy. If you have a business crime reduction partnership in your area, they probably operate the radio scheme. And if you don't have a radio, um, it's a good idea to revisit whether you might want one for this um, season for the season upcoming, because obviously 
Um, if there are groups of people that are causing issues in the town or city, that tends to get communicated on the radio. And there are other ways that you can sort of call on support through it normally as well. So um, having a radio uh, or being part of the BCRP where they communicate information about upcoming events and, and things that are happening and perhaps even things like policing plans and, and what they look like going forward, that can be a really good source of information as well. If you have a business crime reduction partnership and you're not already a member, it's, it might be something to look at. Um, and then seeking local advice. So, you know, the statutory partners are there to work with you and to make sure that you, uh, you know, all, all come together to, uh, to yeah, provide a, a really great environment for people to come and visit. So if you have questions, speak to your local offices, um, speak to your licensing officer and, and you know, poli uh, police and council licensing representatives or community safety. They'll have advice. Um, they would much rather that you go to them proactively and um, talk to them about any concerns that you might have and so that they can help you to kind of mitigate those and um, put a plan in place uh, rather than waiting for it to, you know, potentially go wrong. And then accreditation schemes. Um, there are a number of different accreditation schemes, but obviously uh, the one that I represent is Best Bar None. Um, it's been going since 2003, and I'll talk a bit about what we cover in the next slide, if that's OK. Um, so Best Bar None is, a, is an assessment of your premises, but also your policies and practices and everything that you do. Um, and it's been developed with um, and supported by the Home Office, but it's also crucially been developed with the licensed trade. So. Um, it's about a two hour accreditation, but we work very closely with the licensed trade to understand, you know, what are those things that really that you do over and above the general kind of licensing act requirements that demonstrate your responsible operator. Um, you know, we, we it has to be a robust accreditation. So it is, you know, a good two hour visit, but actually it goes through everything that you do. Um, pulls that all together and then at the end you get a report to say you know this is what you're doing really well here are some areas where you could have scored more and here's a link to some resources for you to be able to do that and that's normally sort of free of charge um, advice and tools and templates and kits and things so that you can actually use those to increase your score for next time um, or indeed if you don't pass the first time uh, we support you through to get getting that pass mark and the great thing about accreditation schemes is that actually that gives you a a reason to sort of in a softer way to promote to your customers how you um, ensure that you uh, you know that you that you keep them safe and, and it sort of demonstrates your commitment to their well-being. These are some of our partners so it gives you an idea of how well supported and how broadly supported we are in the industry and we're very very fortunate and very grateful to our sponsors for giving their time and expertise to the scheme. A brief sort of summary there of what we assess. I won't go through it all because you can see the um, the list on there, but um, venue management is probably the longest section. It's sort of all the practical elements about safety and security and those sorts of things. Staff training and care speaks for itself, um, but also some well-being there and even things like, you know, how you help your staff get home at night. And I know that's a big issue for a lot of you at the moment. And we hear from a lot of licensees that they're driving their staff home at the end of the night because of the lack of taxis and things. So we know that there's some issues there. Um, customer safety and welfare, again, you know, that covers some of the elements of the licensing act, like protection of children from harm, but it goes further than that. It's, you know, do you operate off for Angela? Um, do you uh, give your staff vulnerability training? And how do you help your customers to get home at the end of the night? That kind of thing. Customer experience in community is like a softer um, a softer element to it, because we recognise that actually a lot of you um, demonstrate your commitment to responsibility by the way that you operate and, and how you, and what you offer and the the, the um, operation that you have in your premises in terms of your style of operation and you know the music that you play and um, whether you offer things like you know family friendly activities and that sort of thing so that's all um, included as well thank you next slide so yeah if you have any questions please do get in touch there's my email address there's probably the easiest thing to do um, and I'm really happy to um, point you in the direction of any resources or materials or support that I can or support you myself. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was, that was brilliant. Some really good points. If you get a chance to uh, get some of the Q&As at the end, I know that there's a couple of areas that we've certainly already been speaking to some of our clients about, but that was really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Graham, if I may just pass straight on to uh, cover your session. Thank you. Abs absolutely, David. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you very oh, much. That's always, that's always a good start. Always a good start. 
Um, can I just start by saying um, thanks to the guys at SHIELD, um, to you, David, for your kind words, also to Rob and Danny, with whom I work closely, for the kind invitation to speak here this morning. Um, I think that the whole webinar is a very good idea um, uh, in the, in the build-up to a very, very busy time of year for the licensed industry. Um, I, I'm a partner at Popleston Allen. Um, we're specialist solicitors to the licensed industry have been since 1994. So we provide advice to everybody from large pump, pub companies, uh, nightclub operators, restaurant groups, caravan parks, um, right down to you know, independents who may have um, one pub or one restaurant. Um, what we have coming up this December is in my view, a sort of perfect storm of two high risk periods. Uh, I mean, we're forever, throwing out bulletins in advice in advance sorry of every Christmas period and every large sporting event in terms of sort of top tips to try and you know stop it all from uh, from going wrong and uh, and I suppose in the worst case scenario from you know your business being closed at a time when you know you should be reaping the rewards of um, you know periods of heavy customer footfall and all of the rest of it so we're constantly doing that and here we are we have two of them occurring at the same time and of course that's the first time that's happened because um the world cup traditionally takes place in the summer and this is a, a departure um uh, so we've got the two things happening at the same time and um, this is important because in the build-up to any christmas and this is based on experience from our firm the the police in particular and licensing authorities they do they do get quite tense um about you know the, the the levels of people that are out and the fact that they're all in high spirits that they perhaps want to consume more alcohol than they might normally do uh, and all of the risks that, that 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 brings with it um and the strain on police resources and um, we can almost guarantee on an annual basis and bear in mind again that normally there's not a world cup in play um, we can almost guarantee that there will be a number of expedited reviews in the run up to Christmas. And for those of you who don't know exactly what that is, I think most of you probably know what a review of a premises license is when things go wrong. But the sharpest tool in the licensing toolbox for the police is the expedited review, which takes you before a licensing committee within 48 hours. And 95% of the time results in you being closed until the full review hearing, which if that happens in mid-December, means you're gonna miss the entire Christmas trade. Um, and uh, you know, this power was particularly designed for things like stabbings and shootings, but it's actually used just for general problems of serious crime and disorder, um, which can obviously occur in the build up to Christmas and potentially exacerbated by throwing in a World Cup into the mix. Um, so it's important to be aware that there are very real risks here um, in terms of enforcement, and they can very, very quickly sort of pull the rug from under you in, in terms of the opportunity that's presented uh, to make up for lost time and, um, and generate considerable income and footfall over the Christmas period. So if we start with the basics, um, and it's important not to um, give uh, either the police or the licensing authority when they're conducting, uh, which they will, inspections during the during the run up to the Christmas period. Um, you know, don't give them, don't, don't give away any easy penalties, as it were. Um, make sure that the summary of your license is on display. The license comes in two parts, part A and part B. The part B is the summary, and that's the one that just gives the basic details of the license, the, the activities that are authorised and the hours that are authorised, and that's supposed to be prominently on display. So just make sure you've done that because you wouldn't believe the number of licensed premises. Here we are, what, 17 years after the arrival of the Licensing Act 2003, I say 17 years because it came in in 2005, and people still don't have their summaries on display. And um, You're also obliged to be able to produce your premises license, so that's the part A and indeed any relevant personal licenses for those who are working at the premises. And that's again, a legal obligation under the Licensing Act. So I would suggest that those should be, certainly the premises license should be readily available in the safe, in the office, wherever it is that you handily keep things and personal licenses perhaps likewise, or, or, or on the person of the individual who holds the personal license. And um, you should also have your written bar staff authorizations um, ready and available for inspection. A lot of premises have them on display. This is where the, you're, you're obliged under the Licensing Act that, that any personal license holder gives specific authorization to those who don't hold a personal license to sell alcohol on their behalf. 
So it's normally a list of staff members who are perhaps rotated to work over the Christmas period, um, together with signatures and counter signatures um, on behalf of the personal license holder and those that are authorised. So it's absolutely clear to anybody inspecting that those people are authorised to sell alcohol. Um, basic again, but make sure you read your license conditions. Um, you wouldn't believe, again, how many people aren't aware of the exact stipulations of their license um, and the consequences can be quite dire for failure to comply with them. So uh, a useful refresher, read through them, make sure you're doing everything that the license stipulates. And again, a very basic requirement, um, make sure that the person who is named on the license as the designated premises supervisor didn't leave three months ago. Um, again, incredible how many times that still comes up. And, um, and again, the consequences can simply be that the, um, that the police or licensing authority will, will tell you that you cannot sell alcohol until that situation is, is resolved. All of those items I've mentioned, with the exception of bar staff authorizations, are potential criminal offences um, under the Licensing Act, so subject to prosecution and potential criminal conviction. Um, let's be honest, nobody wants that at the best of times, uh, and certainly not in the, in, in the run-up to Christmas. But of course, if you're breaching license conditions, um, you, you can also easily end up in a, in a review situation, probably not an expedited review unless it's something very, very serious, but nonetheless, not something you want to happen um, in the uh, busy run up to Christmas. With specific regards to the World Cup, um, I think you've got to bear in mind, my understanding is that certainly in the early rounds, there are some matches starting at 10 a.m. Again, check your license to make sure what, your, what, what, what the start time of your license is, both the opening hours and the commencement of licensable activities, particularly the sale of alcohol, because that's going to be relevant. And you may, of course, have customers that want to come in before 10 o'clock to get warmed up, maybe have some breakfast, whatever. Um, I just make sure that your license permits you to do that. If it doesn't, you need to apply for a temporary event notice. Um, and in that regard, because there will likely be an inundation of these, um, on the police who see them all and also licensing authorities get them in sooner rather than later um, so that you don't find yourself in a situation where the, where the authorities just don't have time to process them. Um, I appreciate it's relatively unlikely compared to a summer event, but there will be premises with heaters and so on who may want to um, show the sport on um, outside screens. Um, again, you've got to be very careful with that in terms of how any external areas are managed. Um, and particularly with regards to noise, um, if we're talking about evening games, residential areas, so on and so forth, important to bear all of that in mind um, and make sure that you've thought about it and taken appropriate measures to control it um, in terms of supervision, supervision of the area and, uh, and noise levels from the football itself, but also perhaps controlling numbers of people out there because, of course, you've got people noise to worry about as well. Um, it, in, I, th I think Sylvie already alluded to this, but the, um, the police quite often issue local advice um, to licensed premises in terms of measures they would expect to be in place. Now, sometimes this is dealt with by, you know, personal visits to licensed premises, resources permitting, but sometimes it's simply a letter drop. And um, they may be suggesting things like, you know, double check that your CCTV has got full coverage and that it's working and it's recording and all of that sort of stuff. Consider the use of polycarbonates um, rather than normal glassware um, you know look at your security levels and your staffing levels all of that sort of stuff and there may be a whole, whole load of other stuff to do with training um, obviously these are advisory letters they're not binding in the sense that the conditions on your license are but you, you, you'd, you'd be mistaken I think if you thought that they were entirely optional um, because of course if something does go wrong and uh, say, for example, worst case scenario, you had a glassing in your premises and they've clearly written and said you should be thinking about polycarbs. That's just not good evidence from your perspective in terms of any review that might come down the line. So it's important to digest what they say, take it on board. Uh, obviously, risk assess, it, risk assess it in terms of your own particular business model, but perhaps think about adopting as many of the, um, the, the policies or measures that they are suggesting as you possibly can. Um, Going back to the beginning then, it's it's a perfect storm. Um, you've not only got the World Cup happening, but you've also got people wanting to go out in the build up to Christmas, uh, Christmas parties, family get togethers, all of that sort of stuff. Um, all of this happening in tandem. Um, what, what the police and, and licensing authorities would always say about any high risk event, and this has got to be categorized as such um, with the two of these things colliding, um, is that you risk assess what you're doing. And, um, you know, that sounds, what does that mean? Well, it, it basically means, you know, analyze your business, 
the, the, the amount of people you're going to have in there, what's going on, the fact that everybody's going to be up for it, whether it's the football or whether it's Christmas. Um, and, you know, try and determine what are the likely things that could go wrong in the worst case scenario and what measures am I going to put in place to mitigate the risk of things going wrong. It's as simple as that. And that's what a risk assessment is. Um, so looking at things like staff levels, uh, numbers of security staff, um, obviously making sure you're op operating within your fire risk assessment capacity, but potentially lowering it if you can't get the staff to deal with the full capacity and making sure that your training is completely up to date with regards to underage sales, drunkenness, vulnerability, and so forth. You do all of that, you should be good to go. Thank you very much. Graham, thanks so much for that fabulous insights. And uh, there's, a lot to, there's a lot to think about during this incredibly busy period. Um, to tie in and to develop those themes, uh, Rob's going to take us through um, some of the practical preparations uh, to develop Graham's concept of risk assessments. We'll hand over to Rob to bring these alive for us. Over to you, Rob. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, David. I'll just do the, the check. Can you hear me OK? Sounds all right. Yeah, I think you can hear me fine. I'll get a thumbs up from David. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you to Graham and Sylvia as well for um, your, your, your interesting talk so far. So what I'm going to talk about is, um, this is based on the Eximus Guide, the Eximus Risk Assessment that's available for, for download. And there's three areas I'm going to concentrate on today, which is your team, your menu and your venue. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is this concept of resources and capabilities. Now, we know when, um, unfortunately, through the incidents, accidents, near misses that I've sort of uh, been involved in, investigated during my time working for local authorities, as a safety manager for Shield Safety, and indeed, my colleagues, the consultants, the safety advice line at Shield Safety, we know often that when things go wrong, when there's a mismatch, there's a mismatch between the resources and capabilities of an organisation and their aspirations and their desires. They have an idea of what they want to deliver. You know, that might be a, a wedding reception for 100 guests. It might be an event out in the garden. And there's a mismatch between what they're capable of and the equipment they have and what they deliver. And that mismatch, as I say, might be uh, inadequate equipment, inadequate space, uh, inadequate uh, cooling of food in the kitchen or an inadequate competency and understanding within the team. And what I'm going to do today is just talk about making sure that you've got the competency uh, and uh, to, to under competency and resources to deliver both an efficient and safe excellence. So first of all, looking at team, what we're interested in there is right people, right place at the right time. Um, we know that there's going to be peaks when there's certain games on, but don't just focus on the home nations. Look at uh, if there's other people in the community, if there's a particular country that's um, there's a number of those resident in your area. So yes, we know there's going to be a peak around the home nations games, but also think about the local community to see if a particular country is uh, heavily represented within the area. Uh, we also know with colleagues, I was chatting with at a BII event last week, they were saying that there's a doubling in the number of temporary staff, agency staff that are being used in kitchens now. That's not even before we get to Christmas. So making sure that if you have got those temporary team, those agency staff, they understand your operation. And that moves on to the next point about making sure your team are, are trained. And, uh, and Graham, you mentioned this as well. Think about the legal training. That's their food safety, health and safety, fire safety. Very easy to deliver that through uh, e-learning. But also you need to think about operational training that the businesses are going to change. There's this fantastic opportunity here. Um, it is going to be different because it is the winter time. So making sure that those operational new ways of working, new approaches are trained into the team they, and they're understood. And also I'm sure Graham would agree with me is and make sure that you can demonstrate that knowledge. Um, so if it does go wrong, that you can demonstrate your team have been trained. Also think about your team and the resources available to them. They're going to be working outdoors. We know, again, talking to, to lots of uh, friends and colleagues in the um, in the pub hospitality industry, they're saying, yeah, we're going to use the spaces, Rob. We're looking to use the patios. We're going to use the garden. We're going to put marquees up. Uh, OK, they, they work during the summer, but now we're putting team out into this cold, potentially wet and windy areas and making sure that they've got the equipment to stay warm, the right uniform, the right footwear. Um, we say in the guide, if you read it, it's a great opportunity to get your branding onto your team. So it may be a the, the, the mucky duck uh, bobble hat or whatever it may be, or maybe go to your suppliers. So there's a great opportunity to make sure the team have got the right equipment, the right uniform to work outside, but also to promote your brand. So that's just quickly covering off team. Looking at your menu, 
again, we know time after time, uh, food poisoning outbreaks are caused because the kitchen isn't sufficient of sufficient size or equipment to deliver the menu safely. So that means is there sufficient cooling, is there sufficient areas to prevent cross contamination? So what you need to do is, yes, there's maybe an aspiration to expand the menu, expand the number of covers you're delivering, but ensure that the kitchen is safe to do that. And of course, if it's not, if it's limited, then you need to go back and change your aspirations, simplify the menu that's being delivered uh, and look at operating the kitchen uh, within its capabilities. And that includes the menu. So we often talk about menu engineering. I think that's something we're familiar with. We men menu engineer for margin to ensure that the gross profit is being achieved, but also looking at the menu and engineering it to deliver it safely. So that might mean, for example, buying in a bought product over a, a raw, say like a raw chicken breast. And actually what you're doing here is you're uh, engineering safety into the menu as well as margin. And when I was thinking about this, and again, conversations I was having last week, I'm aware that actually uh, we always thought of the, 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 the in-house made products had a better margin. But as we start factoring in utility costs, it's really quite possible that that bought in ready to, uh, you know, ready to go or ready to reheat product. Not only is it safer, the margin may not actually be that different. The profit margin may not actually be that different from producing raw uh, to cooked. So ensure that when designing the menu, it's within the capability of the kitchen, within the capability of the team, and then cut your cloth, cloth accordingly. Then the last one on your menu is allergen management. There's an opportunity here to introduce some new products, um, but in doing so, make sure that the allergen management that the guest is communicated with, they know what uh, the ingredients are in the product, what allergens are present. So ensure that your allergen matrix, matrices are up to date. Um, also think about how new products could impact your kitchen. So again, taking that chicken example I just used, if it's a breaded product and it's going through the fryer, are you introducing a new risk of uh, cross-contamination from gluten because you're using another fryer well? So again, when you're designing that menu, we're, we're very good at typically thinking about bacterial contamination, but remember the allergen contamination and also the ability to communicate the allergens to the guest. So that's your team, that's your menu. Finally, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is your venue. Um, Christmas is, it? <laughs> we've already said, we're bringing these two things together. We're bringing together the World Cup, we're bringing together Christmas. We're going to be using the venues differently. But also what do we do at Christmas? Well, we, we throw a Christmas tree into the, into the um, the site, we may have a point of sale display, a Christmas table mocked up for your Christmas bookings. So when ordinarily, we're, we're filling hospitality venues with more stuff than we would do. And now we're probably gonna to want to actually fit more people in there. So what I'd encourage is when we're setting up the venue, is set it up with safety in mind, ensure that the fire exits are kept clear. I know it's an obvious one, but the risk of fire is significant. Consider the slips, trips, hazards, Ensure that actually your team can move freely around the premises as well, because if they're doing drink service, if they're running food, can they work safely and efficiently around the, uh, the hospitality venue? So when you're setting it up, set it up with safety in mind. The other thing that we've talked about is the, the World Cup. It's a summer event um, in the winter months. And yes, it's great to be using and maximising outside spaces, but make sure those spaces that are ordinarily used during the summer holidays are fit for purpose in November and December. So that again means consider lighting, for example, consider the slip strips and falls, think about the tented structures, are they suitable? Um, think about heating, both for the comfort of your guest and also for the welfare of your team. So when you're setting up, there's the ordinary operation of the, the outside venue to consider, but think about the, uh, the extreme. So you may be dealing with snow and ice where typically you'd be clearing just the pathways from the car park to the, uh, to the pub or the hotel or to the hotel, clearing the path. But actually now you've got a whole patio that you may have to clear. Think about adverse weather conditions. So a marquee that you're putting up in the summer months is absolutely fine. But now suddenly you've got the risk of wind, hail, uh, torrential rain. Are the structures suitable for the weather that's going to be coming in November and December? And then the final one is know your limits. And again, that goes right back to the, um, the concept of resource and capabilities is know the limit of, uh, of your venue. Know how many people you can safely fit in there and also for comfort as well. Uh, and that may mean if you're making significant alterations to the premises, if you're, if you're changing the layout, to go back to review your fire risk assessment, ensure that your fire risk assessment is suitable and sufficient for the way that you're setting the premises up now. So hopefully that was just a quick overview of your team, your menu, your venue. If you wanna read more, there's, there's more in the guide I'm just about to introduce. But what I'd like to talk about now is something that we're launching from Shield Safety, and we're calling it the Shield Safety Net. Now this is gonna be made available 
for uh, the period of Exmas through November into December. And we know it's been a tough period for hospitality. Um, and this is our way of helping out. This is our way of doing our bit uh, to help uh, the businesses uh, and the industry to have both a safe uh, and efficient and hopefully a very uh, prosperous uh, time. So what does the Shield Safety Net include? Well, first of all, we've got the Exmas guide. So that's available for free download now. Please use it. With, uh, we're really proud of it. It talks about not only safety within your business, it talks about licensing. It also talks about opportunity, opportunity to, to grow revenue. And of course, there's a, a risk assessment. We've written this in a way I know people can be bamboozled by risk assessments. They can be fearful of them. But we've created this risk assessment available for download. So complete the risk assessment, use it as a check, use it as the way to ensure that your business is going to be operating uh, safely. And then the two new elements that we're really pleased to be launching is a free access to our risk proof monitoring module. So you can do um, uh, your daily daily checks in there, your opening checks, your closing checks. Checks are so important. I'm sure both Graham and Sylvia would uh, concur. That it's really important that you can demonstrate that you have opened your business safely, you reviewed the day, uh, and also you've done periodic checks in there as well. So that's for your own good, for your team's good, but also to demonstrate to regulatory officers that your control of the business. And then the final element of the Shield Safety Net uh, is our safety advice line. So that's our colleagues, our team of environmental health practitioners will be available there to answer your questions. It may be, how do I do a barbecue outside safely? What do I need to know about a tented structure? What team training do you think I need to be doing? And so we're really proud uh, that you'll have access to our safety advice line as well. So that's it from me, David. Uh, I'm hoping there'll be many questions. Thanks very much, Rob. Thanks to all of our speakers. I think uh, hopefully there's some brilliant insights and quite a lot of top tips. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, there are some questions which have come through. Uh, first question, um, Sylvia, if I may come to you. Um, you talked a little bit, uh, one thing that you said, I think resonated, which was around getting people home. And I guess this is something in city centers, which we it sounds like we're gonna have very full venues with the risk that everyone is gonna be leaving those venues at roughly the same time. Is there any tips that you can give as to how you could help, how venues could potentially help facilitate not only getting their customers home safely, but more possibly more importantly, their staff and colleagues? Yeah, uh, I wish I had a really robust answer for this because it's a it's a huge issue actually that we're seeing nationally. Um, it won't be a surprise as a perfect storm of, you know, people leaving the you know the driver, you know, taxi drivers leaving the trade, but also having had some time off over COVID and realizing it's quite nice spending some t evenings in with family, etc. So, uh, taxi shortages is huge. But my best advice would be to start to really have some productive conversations with you know, interested parties like your local um, taxi licensing uh, council representatives, if you've got a business improvement district, start to have a conversation with them to, to sort of raise your concerns around what a big issue this is going to be going into Christmas. And perhaps they might be minded to look at things like, um, you know, bus provision or um, to see if there's some sort of something that they can do to mitigate the the um, the issue, because, yes, it's a, it's a big one. And I don't have a, have a very robust answer, I'm afraid, for that one. That's okay, Sylvia. I wonder if it's worth almost venues almost proactively contacting their local taxi operators just to see if there's anything that they could proactively put in place, particularly for colleagues. But yeah, it's um, it's not an easy one to solve. Um, Graham, there's a question. Uh, top marks, Graham, for using the first pun about the easy penalties. We've been talking a lot about getting max. Couldn't help myself. Well done. Yeah, great. Um, there's a couple of questions just very quickly. Question around uh, temporary licences. Um, your advice was to get in early, but typically yeah. how long would it take for a venue to get a license once they've applied? Okay, well, <clears throat> if you're applying for a temporary event notice, you generally have to give 10 working days notice. Um, it's important to understand that, that that doesn't include the day you apply and it doesn't include the day of the event. So, right. um, but yeah, so there's got to be 10 working days between the day you apply and the day of the event, if that makes sense and to apply for a temporary event notice. Um, so that's that's the basic statutory framework. There is also the ability to go for a late temporary event notice, which is only five working days notice. The disadvantage of that is that 
if anybody objects to it, it simply gets rejected. So um, it's it's it, it's not as good. But if you're if you if you if you're if you're stuck, you can go down that route. Um, the, the problem I was alluding to really was one of um, resourcing again, and that within the police in particular, we see all of these temporary event notices that they will undoubtedly encourage people to get in there much earlier than that if they possibly can, so that there's plenty of time to process them, lest there be an inundation at the last minute. Super, thanks. And and just whilst we're on, there's there's a question for those who may not be quite as um, or fair with the situation. What's the difference between a personal license and a premises license? So the premises license, uh, if you if you're um, <clears throat> in old money a pub landlord, um, you'll have a premises license for the physical structure that is the pub, but you also need a personal license in order to be able to sell alcohol at that pub or any other pub. And um, so there's there's two aspects: licensing premises and personal, and both have got to be in place to facilitate the sale of alcohol. Super, thank you, Graham. Um, I think we were talking. Um, I think Graham may, may have mentioned about the the timings. As as far as our uh, planning is, we think that there's going to be four games a day for the first roughly two weeks. It's another interesting aspect of excellence with regards to the World Cup is it's the shortest. World Cup in a duration that's ever been. So it's going to be four weeks from start to finish. And as a result, they're having to cram four games a day in for certainly the early part, which means the first game starts at 10 a.m., a game at 1 p.m., a game at 4 p.m., and then the final game at 7 p.m. Um, it's worth noting Friday, the 25th of November, um, which is Black Friday, traditionally one of the busiest days in retail, the busiest day in retail, will also happen in the middle of Exelmas. And at 7 p.m. on Friday, the 25th of November, England play the USA at 7 p.m. So there's a particular pressure point on that in, on that specific day. And with that, I think if I can maybe hand over to Rob to to close off the Q and A. If there's only there's all, there's been some brilliant insights and and, and excellent um, ideas come through. What are the three things, Rob? If if anyone's tuning in, what are the three things that you, as an experienced uh, risk assessor and environmental health practitioner, what are the three areas that you would be in the top of your list for venues, Rob? Well, I like working in threes, David, that's a good thing. <laughs> so you saw from my presentation, so thank you for giving me one which has, has three answers. I think the first one I would say, um, and I, I haven't talked about it too much, um, but I'm sure Sylvia and Graham would uh, agree, is know your customer because with your customer comes different risks, you know, that customer profiling. And actually what we're seeing over Exelmas is po possibly a mixing of that customer. So we're talking about the office party and their expectations, their needs and wants. And then we're talking about the group that are going out to watch the football. So if you're a business, if, you're, if this is the first time they're mixing, think about the needs, wants and expectations of that customer and how they can conflict and how your team need to respond differently to them. With that as well, think about the long-term impact on your business. Uh, and I know Graham, because we've had conversations about this before, is, you know, there's this short term opportunistic period over Exxonus that, um, you know, to, to, to make some, you know, some, some great money. That's what we want to happen. But for fear of a, another pun here, and I'm not a footballer, as you know, um, is, is don't score an own goal. Because there's this real danger, isn't there, that actually the short term gain actually could impact your business from a licensing uh, point of view or actually your customer in the future. They just get confused. So first of all, is know your customer because with that becomes a certain needs, wants, expectations and risk profile. Uh, the next one is, is look at your property, that's your, your asset. How do you make the best use of that without damaging, impacting it in the long term as well? So look at it creatively, but obviously I'm going to say with safety in mind. Um, and then the last one is around your team, is there's going to be a number of changes. Again, make sure your team really understand the expectations based on them, both legally, so from a licensing point of view, from a guest experience point of view. Uh, but make sure they have absolute clarity how you're going to operate the business and then be able to demonstrate that because that's the key, you know, heaven forbid, if something goes wrong, how can you come back to say, look, we understood the risks associated with this. We made sure that the team understood how to operate. And then, you know, I'd be saying the checks that we're, we're introducing through um, the, uh, the, the Shield Safety Net, through Risk Proof, is that you use those checks, have those checks in your business. So when you're opening the doors, you know that everything's in place. You know you're ready for revenue, a great phase from hospitality. At the end of the day, make sure that you've reflected on any incidents and you're learning from the next day and then do those periodic checks to make sure that everything that's needed in your business is in place. So yeah, power of three, I'll go with know your customer, know your property, and then make sure you know your team and they know what's expected of them. Super. Thanks, Rob. Well, 
That brings us to the end of this session. Um, huge thanks to Sylvia, to Graham and to Rob for their insightful and engaging presentations. Thanks to the SHIELD safety team, Richie and Terry, who've been able to facilitate the back end of this webinar. And thank you all for participating. Um, anyone who is registered will receive a follow-up email with a link to a recording of this, so please feel free to share with any of your colleagues, with any of your partners, and may we wish you all an exceptionally happy Excelmas, a successful Excelmas, and most importantly, a safe Excelmas. Thank you. <laughs>